If you're looking for action, for a filmmaker to thrill you to your core, who used music and cinematography to make your jaw drop, with scenes that had impact in every shot, and who the likes of Bay, Abrams, and West learned a few tricks from, then look no further than Scott, Tony Scott. Well, that is pretty funny. The British filmmaker who shaped the style of the modern actioner and created some memorable blockbusters that shaped pop culture. So grab some popcorn and let's head out into the danger zone and remember the forgotten genius of the 80s and 90s actioner. The youngest of three brothers, Tony Scott was born in the northeast of England and was always heading into the arts. The wider Scott family ran a cinema chain around Tyneside, and like his older brother Ridley, Tony had a passion for the arts. He would go from Sunderland to Leeds studying art and eventually following his older brother to the Royal College of Art. Following his studies, Ridley would call his younger brother up with an offer. Tony recounted this in an interview. I was finishing eight years at art school and Ridley had opened Ridley Scott Associates and said, come and make commercials and make some money because I owed money left, right and centre. Come work with me and within a year you'll have a Ferrari. That's the promise made to Tony by his older brother Ridley. A promise that stopped Tony from joining the BBC to make documentaries and made him join the fledgling production company Ridley Scott Associates. He then spent the next several years making commercials, sometimes running the whole of RSA to aid his brother's emerging film career. During these years, Tony Scott developed his own distinctive visual style. And as he confessed in numerous interviews, he had a pretty good time doing it too. I cornered the market in sexy rock and roll stuff. From the start, I had a blast. I had a run of 10 years straight making commercials, during which I got the chance to shag my way around the world. I was paid to film in exotic locations and meet the most beautiful girls I'd ever seen in my life. I couldn't believe it. The standout adverts from Scott's advertising career include one that almost foreshadows his time on Top Gun. That advert, entitled Nothing on Earth Comes Close, has a very simple concept and utilizes a series of parallel cuts that favorably compare a Saab 93 car to the sleek lines and powerful performance of a fighter jet. Atmospheric visuals, slow motion walking, aviator shades, the fetishization of a plane's elegantly sculpted steel, all the hallmarks later found in Top Gun are present here. Another memorable advert for Barclays, starring Anthony Hopkins, uses a deft touch with restrained camera moves for Scott, some very tight editing and sumptuous cinematography, all of which combined with a compelling performance from Hopkins, delivers an advert lauded for years by advertising creatives globally. I want my girlfriend to say good morning, big boy, to which I'll reply, I've got a big day today, a big meeting with a big cheese from a big studio. It's a big time for the big bucks. But not all of his adverts were flashy affairs. As a jobbing commercials director in London during the 70s, Scott would be shooting virtually every week and as a result would refine his flashy directing style and get used to working with a wide range of budgets. Commercials he shot on tighter budgets included one for Smarties and also Hobbies Bread, which, unlike the iconic advert that his brother shot called Boy on the Bike, Tony's advert is a simple affair that is more script-led and has a lovely gag about age. By the time he had released his first film as director in 1983's The Hunger, his commercial work and style had really developed. His advert in 1984 for Shell Petrol, as an example, showcases a strong visual style and the power of a great song. His use of lighting and editing, as well as clearly having a cinematic vision for the commercial, both showcase why it would only be a matter of time before he came to Hollywood's attention. The legendary movie producer Jerry Bruckheimer was the first person to see the energy and dynamism that ad directors could bring to movies, largely because he was from a commercials background himself and was seen that not only could they work at speed, but that they would bring a definitive style to their work while also being used to working within budgets, something the 80s Hollywood system had, was keen to adopt after the excesses it had often been witness to in the 1970s. Yet Scott did not have an easy transition into filmmaking. His debut as director, The Hunger, did not go down well with critics or moviegoers, as highlighted by the critic Roger Ebert. The Hunger is an agonizingly bad vampire movie circling around an exquisitely effective sex scene. Sorry, but that's the way it is, and your reporter has to be honest. However, the film was praised for its style. Scott's use of fast cutting, provocative sexuality, pop music cues, and billowing curtains were not considered sufficiently cinematic. So the film was dismissed as all style and no substance. But both Jerry Bruckheimer and his producing partner, Don Simpson, saw this and his body of commercial work as proof that Scott was their man for Top Gun. 
Scott, initially reluctant, finally agreed to direct Top Gun. While the film received mixed critical reviews, it was a box office smash, becoming one of the highest grossing films of 1986, taking in more than $350 million. You two characters are going to Top Gun. I feel the need. The need. One of the legendary stories from Scott's directing days relates to his time at the helm of Top Gun. Jerry Bruckheimer has famously said in multiple interviews that the aircraft carrier was cruising in the wrong direction for Tony. He wanted to have it backlit and it was frontlit and the sun was going down. So he went to the Admiral on the ship and said, you've got to turn the carrier. The Admiral said, no, it's too expensive. It was about $15,000 just to do that and Paramount wouldn't approve it. Tony wrote him a check right there. The check bounced. Son, your ego is writing checks your body can't cash. As well as a music video for George Michael, Scott would make two more movies in the 1980s with Beverly Hills Cop 2 and Revenge, both exemplifying what ad directors were initially bringing to features. Rich with blaring pop rock soundtracks, stunning visuals and fast-paced editing. All elements that would come to define his style. Scott's film output would define the 1980s genre of blockbuster popularized by Simpson and Bruckheimer, the Hollywood producers who became his patrons. And it's no surprise that Michael Bay's style is incredibly similar to that of Scott's. Both Ridley and Tony Scott emerged out of the 80s being hot property in Hollywood, and the 90s would define them both as two of the world's finest filmmakers. But the brothers would have very different styles, as highlighted by Tilt magazine. Ridley's films, good and bad, play out like classical music, stately, elegant, unrushed, somber. Tony's movies are rock and roll, fast, loud, exhausting, sometimes painfully bright. The start of the 1990s would see Scott team back up with his Top Gun star and the film's producers to make the NASCAR-inspired movie Days of Thunder. I think he can drive. Oh, he can drive. He can drive beyond the limits of the tires, the engine, the car, anything else. And as well as continuing a prolific commercial career, he would direct seven feature films, starting with the aforementioned Days of Thunder and ending the decade with what many movie fans and critics say is one of his best films, 1998's Enemy of the State, starring Will Smith. It also featured the return of Gene Hackman as a neurotic and paranoid ex boot Why are they after me? Two targets, rooftop. You have something they want! A role familiar to any film fellow's followers as remarkably similar to the one in the conversation. It hit the right notes. First of all, in casting Smith in one of his earliest serious roles, Tapping into the growing sense of unease surrounding new technology and the Big Brother state, an excellent cutting edge filming and post-production techniques. An aspect of Scott's work often overlooked for the more obvious fast-paced edits and exceptional action directing. Certainly carjacked a really nice car. Another of his 90s outputs, which is now regarded as one of his finest films, is 1993's True Romance, written by Quentin Tarantino. Initially, the film bombed with moviegoers, but critics praised the film for its look, dialogue, performances, and offbeat style. We can speculate that as Tarantino's cult status grew, so did True Romances. The film feels like the perfect marriage of Tarantino's trademark snappy, fast-paced dialogue, plots, and set pieces, and Scott's underrated subtlety in handling this dialogue, and his well-known style and ease of carrying action scenes and grand finales. But, sadly, its initial reception would mean Scott would play it safe for his follow-up, 1995's Crimson Tide. One of the great things about True Romance has to be the performances from the film's who's who of famous actors. Some of the standout performances have to be Gary Oldman as Drexel, the fantastic Sicilian heritage scene between Hopper and Walken, a stoned-out performance from Brad Pitt, and, of course, James Gandolfini's controversial scene in a hotel room. It would be a movie that Tarantino would praise. He was even asked to do on-set rewrites which he was unable to do, which is forgivable, as he was in the middle of his first two directorial outings in 1992's Reservoir Dogs and 1994's Pulp Fiction. However, his writing partner, Roger Avery, would handle these. But despite this initial setback, Scott would call upon Tarantino during the filming of Crimson Tide to aid on improving and punching up the script's dialogue and adding in reference to other submarine films and an argument about the Silver Surfer. Tarantino would later remark following Scott's death, I loved his shit. He's like Douglas Sirk. He never got respect, was too commercial. People put him down. Now they teach classes about him. His relationship with Denzel was one of the best actor-directed combinations of our time. Tim Burton has Johnny Depp. Christopher Nolan has Michael Caine. Tarantino has Samuel L. Jackson. In his three-decade career in Hollywood, Tony Scott has his own first choice, Denzel Washington. And his 2000s output was dominated by his work with the actor. 
They collaborated in five films together, four of which were in the 2000s alone. Washington released a statement to E! News after Scott's death. Tony Scott was a great director, genuine friend, and it is unfathomable to think that he is now gone. He had a tremendous passion for life and for the art of filmmaking, and was able to share this passion with all of us through his cinematic brilliance. Scott directed one of his most critically acclaimed, the submarine drama Crimson Tide. The most popular of the films that they made together is arguably 2004's Man on Fire, a film that the critics didn't love, but was a huge hit with film fans globally. Time Out's review summed up the revenge flick perfectly. It ought to be seriously unpalatable stuff, yet there's something cherishably naff about Scott's jumping bean cutting and hokey cokey camera work that is almost a guilty pleasure, hitting inspired heights of ridiculousness. Their final film together, and in fact Scott's final film as director, was 2010's Unstoppable. A film about a runaway train, starring Washington and Pine, that bucked the trend of films released at the time by being action driven whilst not having a heavy reliance on CG. In fact, whilst there is a lot of action and suspense, the majority of the film is a double header, as the two protagonists, under ever extreme circumstances, open up and warm to each other in a very human way. The film credit Roger Ebert lavishing heaps of praise upon the film on its release. The movie is as relentless as the train, slowly gathering momentum before a relentless final hour of continuous suspense. In terms of sheer craftsmanship, this is a superb film. Two days prior to Scott's suicide, he was with Tom Cruise scouting locations for a sequel to Top Gun. Cruise would remark upon Scott's death that he was a creative visionary whose mark on film is immeasurable. And it's clear to see in subsequent directors, Michael Bay and J.J. Abrahams in particular, that the style of filmmaking he perfected was taken on by a wide range of directors. In fact, you could easily put Michael Bay's name on the directing credentials for 1991's The Last Boy Scout and no one would be any the wiser. No what made Scott unique though, in the long list of action directors, was that he understood action and more importantly, understood how to transform action on screen into suspense and excitement off screen in the minds of the viewers. He was also a filmmaker whose style developed continuously over the years to both good and bad effect. Just look at 2006 Denzel driven Deja Vu, where it was sadly a case of technique and style over substance. So much so that one of the writers, Terry Rossio, has still not seen the finished film over two years later. Which one of the seven dwarfs can explain to me how you get the audio? This later output could be defined by a style that became even more fractured, even more extreme and even more distinctive. This change in style is interesting because it showcased how much of a stylistic leader Scott was, and not just a follower. His movies came to define entire eras of cinema. Top Gun is the 1980s action and inspired countless knockoffs. When too many pretenders diluted his style by copying it, Scott simply reinvented himself. How long before you find out if you're really good? That is the behavior of a true artist, a true auteur. What Scott left behind is an envious body of work that injected an explicit sense of style into mainstream filmmaking. I didn't know that. Tony Scott has bequeathed an aesthetic legacy that pushed boundaries and gave us new ways of looking at the world. Quite a feat for a boy who went from Tyneside to Tinseltown. Got a favourite Tony Scott movie or scene? Then why not comment below? Also subscribe and share, and feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at the Film Fellas UK.